What you're about to experience is one man's quest to see beyond the tumultuous period we're in and to envision what lies just beyond our grasp, yet well within our reach. Welcome to Larry Rifkin's America Trends, where the future has arrived, and it's just in time. America Trends resumes its uh, discourse on the future of American society and politics. And, uh, John, I've got to ask you, this is a very personal question, Uh but it's one that we all share with so many other Americans. Have you ever been outsourced, downsized, or robotized out of your job? Uh, Yes, yes. Really? Yes. Yeah, we were were outsourced. uh, Burroughs bought Sperry back in the 80s when when uh, tech companies were buying each other up. So that closed that company. <laughs> wow, that was your first experience. That goes back to the 1980s? That was in the That late was early 80s, on. Yeah. I've been... And how did you feel, honestly, John? Because I'll tell you, I've only been fired from one job in my life. I was very fortunate. And it was as a disc jockey when I was a kid. It was only a weekend gig. And so it didn't really you know, tarnish my feeling about myself. But boy, that has an impact for a long time. See, I didn't find that because there there was a lot of work still available. So, uh, yeah, I went on to work for Motorola and uh, things were good, you know. So what happened with Motorola? Well, from there, I went to Channel 8. Okay, so you went to the ABC affiliate in Connecticut. And then what happened? Because I know they were doing a lot of automating of their technical facility. Yeah, we were doing that, but then 2008 happened, and they decided they were going to downsize. So... (laughs) <laughs> so you've had the hammer put down a couple of times. I was wondering about that indentation in your forehead. Okay, well, now we understand. But, John, you are not alone. Trust me. In fact, I was startled to learn, John. Now, listen to this statistic in terms of a trend in America, that 40% of today's workforce in our country would consider themselves to be one of these, an independent contractor, a freelancer, a vendor, a consultant, and it all comes down to the same thing. You're basically out on your own, using your own guile and your own abilities and talents, but not being able to say that you're a company person any longer. Yeah, it's, it's a different, it's a different kind of thing, you know. Well, when you think about it, probably the most endangered species, and I know we've got a lot of protections that are going on environmentally for different small little snail garters and other things, but I would say that the FTE is probably the most endangered species in America. I mean, full-time employee. Oh, yes, I think you're right. I think you you caught me there with the FTE. (laughs) You were thinking about a little thing crossing the road, right? (laughs) <laughs> well, Company X wants your services, and they do. They still want them, but they want them on their terms, inexpensively, no benefits, and they want to be able to have maximum flexibility. True, and if they need to get rid of you, they don't want a lawsuit, and they don't want unemployment benefits. Let's be honest about now, it. Now, you're expendable now. I think, I think that's, uh, that's the problem. There's, there's jobs out there available, but you're not going to work full-time. And you are expendable if, if there's no loyalty. The loyalty is gone, I think. And if you like flexibility, you've got it in America today. <laughs> hey, you're on your own. Have a ball. But we are told that there is another trend concomitant with what we're talking about. And it's uh, the one person, one million dollar business. Elaine Pofelt has written a book about this. And look, we're not imagining that everybody who goes out on their own is going to create something that's going to be worth a million dollars or more. What's that? we got to work on this. Well, we're working on this with our (laughs) podcast. We're just shy of that million by about 999,000, because I think that's what we earn with Amazon Associates. But with that said, the reason that a lot of people are able to build businesses today, John, is that they are able to scale them because of the Internet. They're also able to find a lot of great, rich talent available to them to work with them because there are so many of these independent contractors. So they're getting gobbled up by these other small companies that say, hey, I want to hire you. You're an old friend of mine. I know how good you are at software or whatever it may be, and I need your services, but I don't want to pay 
the benefits either. And I'm going to be a one man shop or one woman shop, but I need you to help me. Right, right. But plus the flexibility. I mean, you can be more flexible than a big company can. So, I mean, I could see how this could work. Well, it is going on in America and there is earning power. There is control of your schedule. There is more independence, but it's risky. Let's be honest. Not all of us are entrepreneurs. <laughs> not all of us like the freedom to fail or to succeed. And some of us are afraid of success. Honest to goodness, I know a lot of people that fear success in their own way more than failure because they wonder, well, if I get too big, what's going to happen? Yeah. And will I be able to maintain this? Or with all these other new smarties coming into the market every day, am I going to be outflanked? There's lots of uh, people out there fearful of both failure and success. Wow. But there is a unique breed out there that's growing in numbers, able to build a one person one million dollar business and that's what we're going to talk about today this may be right for you it may not but it's a really interesting phenomenon and we'd like you to listen let's do that all right elaine pofelt joins us right now on america trends elaine pofelt is with us and she's written a book called the million dollar one person business make great money work the way you like and have the life you want now john and i here at america trends we are a two-person army uh, but we're just shy of a million dollars by, well, about 990000 But I've got, <laughs> So I've got to ask you, there are a lot of people out there who understand this concept of a one-person business. But getting to the million dollars, that's the uh, tough part of this. It, it definitely is, and it takes a different way of thinking about your business. It won't happen by accident, for sure. <laughs> but how do people, as they start out... Either they want to go in the direction of uh, starting in their college dorm and then growing into a dynasty like Facebook. How many people are starting to think, no, I don't want that level of bureaucracy. I don't want that oversight. I really want to do it on my own still, my own way, but I want to make a good bit of money. There were more than 35,000 businesses that broke one million to well, they went into the range of one million to two point four nine million in twenty fifteen. But those are very much the exception right now. I, I think there are a lot of people that are saying, I, "I want a lifestyle business." If you look at the um, number of businesses in the U.S. that are small businesses, almost all of them are one person businesses. There's a very small portion that are, are employer businesses. And I think that's by design in the past. I think we looked at businesses that didn't have employees as, as having done something wrong. They failed to scale. Mm -hmm. They didn't become job creators. They didn't read the email. But I think now people are realizing that their life has value, their life outside of work and the time that they have for their children or their interests or their aging parents, or their travel, or whatever really matters to them is important, too. And so I think we see a growing number of people saying, there has to be a better way. I don't want to be on call all the time to a corporation and work 24-7 just to hold on to my job. And they're saying, at the same time, I don't necessarily want to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. Like you said, it, it's a lot of responsibility and not everybody wants that responsibility, but they still may want entrepreneurship. Absolutely. And today you point out that it's a lot easier to do this for two reasons, I believe, but you can expand on this. Number one, you call a lot of these folks free agents. So they're out there and they have an idea. They've got a skill set. And there are a lot of other free agents and independent contractors and freelancers who are out there and they can become part of their network without becoming their employees. And then, of course, you don't need the infrastructure today because of the Internet. Is, is that a good way to describe what's going on? Definitely. The Internet has opened the door for more and more people to run high-revenue, one-person businesses. If you think back to the past, it used to be very expensive just to put up a website. You know, it, I remember early in my business, I, I've been in business for 10 years, advising one client that he couldn't really put up a quality website for less than $50,000. And it really cost that much at the time because of the labor costs and all of the supplies and technological expertise you needed. And now it's gotten so cheap, it's basically free. 
<laughs> you put up a website. But there, there are so many other tools that we have in terms of the mobile phones, video chat, where you can reach customers all around the world. There, there are so many free and low-cost technologies that have opened the door for someone with a shoestring budget to launch a very high-revenue business. And you introduce us to a lot of people like this, and you tell us in the book, the founders of million-dollar one-person businesses and partnerships are everyday people who have grown very smart about making the most of the time that they spend working. And you lay out six categories where this is going on. One is e-commerce, and I think we all understand that. Another, informational content creation, professional services such as marketing and public speaking, real estate, and personal services firms such as fitness coaching. But then you also include manufacturing. Now, that might seem difficult for many of us to understand. Explain that and any of the other areas that you want to talk about. Sure. Well, it's, it's really interesting. Manufacturing is an area that you used to need your own factory for. You needed an army of employees. And today, you can go on sites like Maker's Row and find a lot of the resources you need there, other um, outsourced providers. And what a lot of people are doing today is using co-packers. If, for instance, they go into food manufacturing, they will outsource the packaging of the food so they really could run this business from their home. They're basically providing a certain percentage of their sales to the co-packer in order not to have to take on all of the overhead of running their own plant. And it's, it's a good way to get up and running very quickly. I saw that with a number of couples, um, Luis Zavalos and Rebecca Cronus are a married couple from California, and they wanted to sell honey online, organic honey. Mm -hmm. the, um, Rebecca's dad is a beekeeper, and so they sort of spotted an opportunity because he was selling the bees to commercial farms, and he had this surplus of honey, and it was at a time when there were some problems with adulterated honey coming into the U.S. People wanted to know the origin, so they thought, well, we know the origin, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's sad. And, and so they were able to bypass the whole learning curve of going into – the packaging of the honey themselves by using a co-packer. So that, that's pretty common. I'm seeing that more and more. And it's just something that has taken off. And because the companies have the ability to market the product on the Internet, they have the reach that it once required a much bigger company to have. You know, when I was in college, of course, and this goes way back to the 1970s, we all thought we'd go to one company and we'd work for 30 years. We'd have all the benefits we want. What is it that uh, young people today who are in college are thinking? Because you remind us that right now, I guess we have about 28 million small businesses in America that do have employees, but we're up to 23 million that are non-employers in this category of free agents. I mean, this will eclipse, I would imagine, those small businesses that do have employees once we have enough of a pool of others who can be resources to you. Uh, how soon do you see us eclipsing that, and is that really the trend that we're seeing out there? Well, I, I think it's hard to tell because there's a lot in flux in the labor market, but we're seeing a big trend where corporations don't want to keep people on payroll. They, since the Great Recession, they've looked for ways to keep costs down, and that was a huge shock to the whole financial system. I think it traumatized a whole, yes. <laughs> whole generation of leaders running companies because we never saw anything like that before. But it also changed the way that people perceive corporate jobs because they saw so many people getting laid off. In the case of very young people just entering the workforce, maybe their parents were laid off or people that I saw a number of people in this book who were just starting their careers at that time and saw a very limited opportunity by going the corporate track. So I think there's a desire for people to have a little more control over their own economic destiny, whether it's going into their own business full time or having a side business just in case. You, it, there's a lot of um, people opening side businesses now. And I think the intention for a lot of them is if something goes wrong with their main job, they could ramp it up. It's hard to just start it. I mean, people do it all the time out of necessity, but 
the time to start the side business <laughs> is, is before you've lost your job in a recession. If you have something going, you've avoided that whole learning curve that slows down. So, Elaine, are most of these businesses income? starting out, and not as a lark, I'm not going to say a lark, but they're starting out without a lot of risk. In other words, they're not investing a lot of money in terms of the old capital-intensive uh, industries, and yet they're not also banking fully that this is going to work. Is that how most are starting? It's hard to tell what how what most are doing, but what I would say is among the entrepreneurs I interviewed in the book, there were a fair number who started it while still working in a corporate job. So Laszlo Nadler, for instance, who runs a business called Tools for Wisdom Planners, which mm-hmm. he sells on Amazon. These are day books, but they're a little different from the typical day book in that they're not a list of to-dos. It's more about what what activity can I do that will move me towards my highest purpose in life this week. He started it while working as a project manager in a big bank. He had a wife at home and two children, and he was the main breadwinner, and he couldn't just quit his job. So he kind of did it on the side for two years, and then when he got it to six-figure revenue, that was when he felt confident enough to quit his job. And he, he did make some investment in the business, but because he had that cushion of his salary still coming in, he had some runway to experiment, and he did experiment a lot. And I saw that a lot. Um, the over the um, in, initial investment for a lot of these businesses was very low because of the trend that we talked about, which is, is low cost technology. It really, uh, I would say, almost all of them started for less than five thousand dollars, and there were a lot that started for less than a thousand dollars. That's pretty remarkable and uh, encouraging. In your book, you say when Nadler started, he had no idea how to run a business, and he had no desire to be an e-commerce entrepreneur, one of those six potential routes to creating a million-dollar business. So this was not something that he imagined was even possible. No, you know, it just sort of came out of a passion for um, personal productivity and being organized. As a project manager, you can imagine that would be his strength. And, and he's one of these guys who always has a hack for doing things better, you know, a new automated tool. And so he, he's able to leverage his personal passion in that area and started tinkering around and figuring out, okay, how can I make planners better and and then um, turn that passion into a business? Now, planners are not a passion for everybody. Everybody's got their own unique passions. and And part of the book is about that, is figuring out, you know, what is it that you bring to the table that's unique? Because when you're in a very small business, it's hard to compete with the Amazons of the world, but your one advantage is that you are an individual. And there's you're a unique individual who has talents that nobody else may have and knowledge that nobody else may have. So figuring out which of those that you're willing to monetize and turning them to, into a business can give you a real edge. Are you finding that a lot of these people have a lot of skills themselves or that they really know how to network and they know how to put together a team that is not going to be a team that is employed by them but utilized by them for different purposes? What is the skill set that most commonly defines these individuals? These folks are very good networkers in general. What, what I would say is, although we're focusing on businesses that are one-person businesses and partnerships, the census data um, refers to them as non-employer businesses. There is a team around most of them, and that is one thing that differentiates them from a lot of the businesses that don't scale their revenue. So they will use freelancers. They will use contractors. Sometimes they find them through sites like Upwork or Freelancer. Other times it is through networking. They're constantly looking for better sources. I, I just spoke with one entrepreneur who has a $3.5 million e-commerce store selling 3D printing pens and um, and coolers for people who like to do things like camping. Mm. And he used HireMyMom.com, and he found, he found some good contractors there, and I had not heard of that platform but they, they they know talent is important. They just don't necessarily need the talent all year round or, or full time and may need them for very specialized things like web design. And they're willing to do something that a lot of people in very small businesses are not, which is to not teach themselves how to do everything, but hire somebody else to do it. Yeah, I think that was surprising, Elaine, in the book. You said that most solo business owners do almost everything themselves. 
There's nothing mm-hmm. inherently wrong with being hands-on if you love the work you're doing, but that approach won't get you to the $1 million in revenue. Exactly. You, you have to let go at a certain point, but the challenge is in the beginning, if you have a year-old business, you may not have the cash flow to hire even a single freelancer. So you have to wait for your moment where you feel like, you know what, I can pay that bookkeeper $100 a month to keep my books in order or whatever it may be. I I would recommend for anybody who would like to scale their revenue, think about the thing you're worst at that you're doing yourself that is requiring you to Google all kinds of YouTube videos to try to teach yourself and you're not really doing it successfully. That should be the thing that you offload Sometimes even just a couple of hours a year with someone really good at what they do can be all you need to do. Maybe hiring a good accountant, for instance, if you're doing your own taxes, which I don't recommend. <laughs> that, that's something best left to um, experts, but such an investment can really pay off. Oh, absolutely. We'll return to this episode of America Trends in just a moment. If you like what we're doing here at America Trends Podcast, please don't keep it to yourself. I know there are a lot of people, John, who think, well, if I'm listening and somebody else wants to listen at the same time, maybe we're going to collide and they're not going to be able to hear us. Is that the way the technology works? No, there's plenty of bandwidth. Everybody can listen at the same time. All right. Well, that dispels that that myth. (laughs) Now, you can do a number of things that would really be helpful to us. You could give us a kind rating or a review at Apple Podcasts, and that boosts what they consider to be our value and visibility. What does that do, John? Well, that puts us in the forefront so that you can find us easier, and most important is other people can find us easier. And you can subscribe there or on our site, americatrendspodcast.com, or wherever you're listening, so we can alert you to new episodes of the podcast, which, by the way, we put out twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And stay in touch with us on both Facebook and Twitter at Trends Podcast. Or you can like us on Facebook or follow us where, John? On Twitter. On Twitter. Yeah. That's right. Where the world turns to hear fake news or whatever yeah. it is. Well, well you can us, direct though. message us news. at Trends Podcast <laughs> or using hashtag Trends Podcast. And you know, John, with our growing audience, and really it's been pretty remarkable, a lot of people just came to us the last month or two, and they might have missed earlier episodes. Can they get them again? They can look through them and and, uh, pick the ones they want to listen to. They're all on the website, and a lot of them are up on iTunes, many of them. All right. Well, listen, there's lots of material to listen to. We hope you have the time, and we'll lend it to us because we try to make it worth your while. And thanks so much for listening. And tell your friends. We now return to this episode of America Trends. Are they worried about Amazon finding them or hoping that Amazon finds them? By that I mean, are they worried that uh, their little niche is going to be absorbed or that they are going to be bought out uh, by a larger company and they can really go on and have the time that they want because they're now retired millionaires? That's an amazing question. I, you know, I think the e-commerce stores often like to be on Amazon because it has a lot of reach. There are costs to be on Amazon too, and you know, costs to advertising the business. But I think many of them do like to be on Amazon. Maybe in addition to having their own store, I saw that combination a lot, um, where people kind of diversify things so that they have their own mailing list of customers. Because if they're on the Amazon site, Amazon would have their mailing list, right? And that's pretty valuable. Um, there are some that position themselves for acquisition. One example is Dan Fagella, who started Science of Skill, which is a martial arts hub online. He's a guy who, he's a, um, I, I, I don't know what weight class he would be, but a lighter weight fighter. And he had this video online where he beat a much larger competitor and it gave him some internet fame. And so he um, he created a lot of videos on his site to teach people about martial arts and started selling martial arts accessories. But one of the things he did that would be different from any other online store that's very specialized is he put systems in place that made it very appealing to someone who would buy it in the future because ultimately he wanted to start a business involved with artificial intelligence and he needed the funding for it. So he did things like 
hire a bookkeeping team to keep the books in perfect order. And he met with them once a week to make sure every single thing was always perfect. And he documented all of his systems so that somebody else could come in and do it. And shortly before he sold the business for over $1 million, although it was a one-man business, he brought on a full-time employee and a part-time employee to prove that you didn't have to be a martial arts champion to run this business, that anybody <laughs> could do it who was a good business person. He, he sold it to a team of um, software entrepreneurs, and now he's doing the AI business. So it worked out. So, so they can, you know, some of them really do look to be acquired by someone else. And that's, that's a nice um, benefit of building a million dollar one person business. It's one of the types of one person businesses you can often sell, which is not the case a lot of times when you yourself are the business doing all the work. Yeah, absolutely. Elaine, what are you finding when they are selling? Are they generally selling the sales and revenue? Are they selling potential? Are they selling what it is that they have built to a certain point that they can't take any further? Is there any model for when you are really ready to be gobbled up, if you will? I think it really depends on their personal preference. Not too many of them have sold, but I think the business has to be at a certain point of maturity to even be appealing to a buyer. So in the case of Dan Fagella, he had gotten it to the point where the revenues were pretty steady and there was still untapped potential because you don't want to, if you sell something and it really can't grow anymore, then there's not much of an upside for the investor who's taking some risk by buying it. I mean, somebody might be buying themselves a job, but I think, the type of person who would buy an internet store generally is hoping for some growth beyond just a subsistence job. So I, I think generally it, it is a matter of business maturity and having it all packaged up so that it's airtight. If somebody looks under the hood, <laughs> you know, they're not, there aren't a lot of problems in how it's running. Elaine Pofelt is with us, the million-dollar one-person business. What is it that would keep somebody from even imagining that that was within their scope of possibility. Is it that many people are just scared that uh, everything would fall on them or that the responsibility is totally theirs or are they worried more? Uh, why am I going to do this? How am I going to get credit? Uh, how am I going to have health benefits? Are there impediments that you see that people are trying to overcome before they launch? I think there is a lot of fear of giving up a steady paycheck because we do live in a society where bills are due on usually monthly recurring cycles, sometimes weekly. So if you're used to having a paycheck coming in every week or every two weeks, it can take some getting used to to adjust to life where you might not get paid for months for some of the work that you do. It depends on the business you're in, but if, for instance, you do professional services, I mean, in my business as a journalist, sometimes I get paid in 60 to 90 days. Well, that's a little different than when I used to work at Time Inc. and my paycheck came every two weeks. So you have to live differently. and People have to prepare for that, which means kind of battening down the hatches on their own finances, which they have to be ready to do. There are also people often in their home who they have to think about. You know, if they're suddenly quitting a good job and the business doesn't work out, that may not affect only them. And even if it does, if, if they're a single person and it does affect them only, that's still important because they still have to keep a roof over their head. So these are legitimate concerns. Plus, health care is very expensive. I know there was um, a, a long period of almost 10 years where both my husband and I were self-employed. He, about a year ago, went in-house with his favorite client, but we had to buy health care and it was about the same price as a mortgage. We have a family with four children, and that didn't include out of mm. pocket. It, it was it was almost forty thousand dollars a year, and so for many people, that's a lot of money. It was a lot of money for us, right? Oh, absolutely. And then they, when they start to when see what that costs, then it's like, okay, I, you know, I have to generate a lot of revenue to pay that. And even if you get some tax breaks and things, you still have to pay that premium every month. So you need cash flow. So when people start running the numbers, they realize I have to be really prepared for it. But I think it's important to also consider that you can start it on the side. As we talked about, you don't have to have it all nailed down right away. If you do it that way, you don't have to have the six months of savings in the bank just in case something goes wrong. The other thing is people have sometimes have a working spouse. So 
you may be able to say, hey, you know what, instead of going on vacation overseas this year, maybe we'll go to Hershey Park, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, and save some money and live on the one spouse's salary so that you can do the business. There's a lot of creative Oh, absolutely. People are making uh, many different compromises, particularly reading in your book that 40% of all the people who are working today are considered to be these free agents, temps, freelance, independent contractors. What is the impact of this rising trend in employment in terms of the way we're going to live going forward? I, I think people that sell any products to consumers will have to take this into account because if people are not getting paid in a steady way, then maybe the ways that we're billed will have to change. So uh, new crediting we'll, or new credit models? I, I could see that happening or even new ways of selling where maybe you have variable payments instead of fixed payments on certain things. I, I think we need a lot of creativity in this area. I think certain things like um, getting a mortgage are very difficult no matter what your income, if you're self-employed. I remember doing a story mm once for Creams New York about this, and people with very, very high six-figure incomes were telling me they had to pay cash for their house. And I thought, that was crazy. It was really crazy. Um, you know, but they because of the requirements to prove your income, you know, it was just so burdensome and took so many months that they were just getting fed up and just buying it with cash. I mean, I mean that has to change. And there are some providers that are realizing there's a gap in the marketplace I, I think um, we also need a, maybe a different social safety net structure to reflect that there are people who don't have the protections of W-2 employees. Because if you look at someone who's a contractor, right, they might basically work full time for one client and maybe have a few other clients, but that client is their main income. If their work with that client dries up, they may only get a couple of days notice. And they owe a mortgage, maybe. They may have a family to support. And if you have a lot of people in that situation and there's a big bump in the economy, that's going to have a big ripple effect. And they don't get unemployment. Whereas their neighbor who works the same number of hours for their employer who has a traditional job does get unemployment. And I think as the number of people who are doing more contingent types of work rises, people are going to start questioning why is it that we're like a second class of worker when we... We pay a lot of taxes, too. Oh, know? absolutely. And, and Elaine, and, and, ironically, I think you're going to be helped, or this movement is going to be helped, by the number of retirees. Because when you do retire and you don't have a W-2, even though you have assets, the provability of that is difficult. So I think that you have some uh, wingmen as it relates to retirees and all of this. Let me ask, are there people who are out there? who are getting into their own businesses, uh, whether it was by desire or by necessity, and they really are afraid of succeeding. I mean, I hate to use that term, but from a standpoint of scalability, they don't want it to become a $5 million operation. They'd be happy if they could take home $80,000 a year. I mean, is that fear of succeeding, not just failing, out there? I think that's definitely a real fear for many people because as the business gets bigger and more visible, you become a little bit more of a public person and you lose a little bit of privacy. I think that even happens, you know, if you own a successful brick and mortar business in town, you know, people kind of know you and then they, you're out jogging or something, you know, people see you, it's the guy who owns the pizza store. It, you do lose a little bit of privacy um, and, and there, there are real apprehensions about it, but I think people can get past those things. There are a lot of good business coaches out there. There are a lot of good um, meetups for business owners where you can talk with other business owners about how to get through those things. Um, you know, there's also fears of, of, you know, if you succeed too much, you might fail at a certain point. It's going to end someday. I mean, there's so many anxieties we can all come up with. But things can happen. You know, people are afraid of success in traditional jobs, too. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, you've got to know yourself. And if you need to talk to, to a friendly peer or somebody to help you get through it, you can, you can get, get through it if you need to. How is corporate America looking at this uh, democratization of the one-person business? And they see you out there with a, a part-timer, a freelancer, and a robot. And uh, you're starting to challenge their conventional systems and approaches. And we've seen a lot of upstarts. 
uh, that we thought had no value all of a sudden eclipse uh, these uh, longstanding behemoths and giants. So how is corporate America looking at this trend? I think there's a lot of disruption going on because of this. I think corporate America always kind of moves slowly just by the nature of having a lot of big companies. And there's a lot of churn going on on the Fortune 500, um, not necessarily because of specific freelance businesses, but just this overall trend of these very scrappy upstarts changing things very fast and new technology sometimes wiping out whole types of services that we need or changing the way that we receive them very, very fast. I mean, if you look at somewhere like Airbnb, for instance, I mean, that felt like lightning, <laughs> you know, and and that's really having an impact on the hospitality industry. So I, I think there's opportunity for, for upstarts to challenge the way things are done for sure. Um, I think what, what I'm seeing with big corporations is some of them are really embracing the freelance trend and they're saying, you know what, these types of workers are part of our team Let's make sure we're making the most of their talents. Let's make sure it's not a hassle for them to work with us. They can get paid easily. They don't have to deal with a lot of bureaucracy. They, they have access to the managers they need. I, just being a freelancer myself, I see some companies are very, very advanced and considerate of their contingent workforce. And they're also using contingent workers in very high-level position. So you're talking about people who are near retirement age. A lot of these folks have a wealth of wisdom, but maybe want to scale down their work. And they are available to do consulting. And I, I see a lot of companies welcoming those types of workers who really have a lot of institutional knowledge, sometimes that, you know, their very own company, but who don't want to work full time anymore and maybe have topped out in salary. So there can be a good opportunity there for people that would like to kind of keep a foot in corporate America, but without some of the downsides of it, you know, of being on call all the time. I and mean, so many of these jobs are so demanding, you know, for the people that really want to hold on to them, that they have a tremendous toll on people's personal life. Oh, absolutely. Elaine Pofeld, a perfect uh, topic for America Trends, where we're looking at uh, changes in the workplace, in our society, in politics. Uh, this is just a great subject, and you have really brought it to us with a lot of clarity. The million-dollar one-person business, make great money, work the way you like, have the life you want. Thank you so much for being with us today on America Trends. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Elaine.